Hello, human geographers. We are back at it again this evening. Tonight, we are going to examine the tools that allow us to collect geographic data. This first unit is what I like to call our toolbox unit. Really, this whole first unit is adding tools to our toolbox, learning how to use them, because then we can begin construction on the temple to human geography that we'll be constructing for the remainder of the year. So let's start with the people who might be interested in geographic data and the different types of data. We call data geographic if we're able to map and analyze it. Individuals may collect and use geographic data by going out into a community and detailing what they see, interviewing residents, or taking pictures. And a variety of different organizations will collect geographic data. One major governmental organization is the U.S. Census Bureau, which attempts to count every person in the United States every 10 years. We'll discuss how and why shortly. Businesses also collect geographic data. Have you ever been to a store and they ask for your zip code? That is the store collecting data that can be mapped and analyzed to determine customer spending habits preferences, and potentially influence where the business may open a future store. Now that we know that a wide variety of people will collect and use geographic data, let's understand two broad categories of this data. Quantitative data is data that can be measured by numbers, like the number of bushels of corn grown in Iowa the U.S. Census Bureau counting up the population of the United States every 10 years is an example of quantitative data. The data is a quantity. Qualitative data is data that is useful because of its quality rather than its quantity. Qualitative data is collected using your five senses. When a geographer goes out into the field and writes down what they heard or smelled or takes pictures of what they can see, that's qualitative data. Qualitative data can be hard to analyze because it can be influenced by people's perceptions and opinions, but it contributes tremendously to our geographic understanding of places and the processes surrounding them. Now that we understand what geographic data is and who is collecting it, let's look at how it's collected. We'll begin with some broad types of geographic tools that you'll have an opportunity to use this year. With more of the world becoming more connected, it's possible for anyone to be an amateur cartographer. As we mentioned in an earlier lecture, we need to be critical of maps and other geographic data we need to question it to make sure that the data has enough quantity or quality to make it reliable. But new technology makes it faster and easier to create high quality maps that can effectively tell a story. It can also connect many people to create crowdsourced maps. The census is a good example of a poll collecting quantitative data by the US government. While the official count of the population is done every 10 years, as required by the U.S. Constitution, the U.S. Census Bureau also conducts other polls to collect data about age, sex, employment status, income, languages spoken, religions practiced, migration patterns, agriculture, and housing. This quantitative data is used for a variety of purposes like determining how many seats each state will have in the U.S. House of Representatives. Field observations involve physically visiting a location, place, or region and recording firsthand information. It's a perfect example of qualitative data. A geographer might see the agricultural processes in action, might smell the poor sanitation system, might speak with the refugee fleeing their home, or hear the language of a local marketplace. Field observations are often the start of geographic inquiry. A geographer is out in the field and they notice something. 
and then start asking questions, collecting data, and evaluating spatial patterns and processes. Personal interviews and media reports have much in common with field observations, but might be carried out by different organizations or individuals and for a different purpose. Travel narratives often describe the physical and cultural characteristics of a particular area or region, often providing a very broad scope of geographic data. Policy documents typically represent geographic data that has been collected by governmental organizations. We'll be examining lots of geographic data coming from the United States government, the United Nations, as well as our state and local governments. Landscape analysis often examines how land is being used. Are we looking at an urban cityscape or a rural agricultural landscape? How is the land being used? Is everything dispersed and spaced out? Or is the land being used intensively with lots of things clustered close together? Finally, Photographic interpretation is something we will do often. It is not uncommon that you will be given a photograph and be expected to analyze the features you see so that you can then apply your geographic knowledge. Geospatial technologies encompass the modern tools used to analyze data about specific locations. There are three specific systems that you need to be familiar with, so we will examine each in detail. The Global Positioning System, or GPS, is a system that determines the precise position of something on the Earth through a series of satellites, tracking stations, and receivers. You've probably heard of this before because you have a GPS receiver with you most places you go, and that's your phone. This system is a space-based navigation system that's owned by the US government. There are 24 satellites in orbit above the Earth which send radio codes to your receiver via stationary tracking stations. The amount of time for that signal to reach your receiver combined with the fact that it is simultaneously contacting several other satellites, finds your exact position on the Earth's surface. Your receiver will be able to contact at least four of the satellites at any time. This system allows us to determine our absolute location on the surface of Earth by determining the latitude, longitude, and altitude of your position. And while most people are comfortable using GPS for navigation, we talked earlier about how you can use it to establish point data that can be helpful in creating a dot distribution map. Our next system is the Geographic Information System, or GIS, which is a computer system that allows spatial data to be collected, recorded, stored, retrieved, organized, manipulated, analyzed, and displayed. Now that definition reads like a laundry list of ways you could use GIS, but it's the analysis piece that is, is especially meaningful. GIS is sophisticated mapping software that places layers of data onto one another to allow us to examine relationships that exist in space between different attributes. This can then be used to conduct research or address problems. One common use of GIS involves comparing natural features or topography, which is the shape and features of the land surface, with human activity, such as flood potential or industrial pollution levels. Here's one example in this map. We can see data associated with heart disease and stroke. In addition to that, we can look at different periods of time, age, sex, race or ethnicity, and poverty to see if there is a relationship between those data sets and the incidence rate of cardiovascular disease. And you can look at the state level or within states at the county level. 
It is fascinating the number of ways that GIS can be used, as we're going to see. Our final specific technology is called remote sensing, which is the acquisition of data about Earth's surface from a satellite orbiting the planet or from other long distance methods. So basically, you're acquiring data from a remote position without making physical contact. If you've ever heard that you're looking at something from the bird's eye view of a location, you're looking at an image that was created by remote sensing. And there are a wide variety of tools that fall under the umbrella of remote sensing. It includes aerial photography, which are highly detailed pictures taken by airplanes or drones. But it can also include satellite imagery, which are generated by sensors mounted to satellites and can acquire data outside the visible portion of the electromagnetic spectrum, like thermal infrared scanning or microwave mapping. Now that we've introduced a lot of different technologies and tools, let's take a look at a human geography problem that utilizes lots of geographic data. One topic that students had to write about on the AP exam is forest cover change. Basically, the cutting down or planting of trees and forests. So this line graph was created by the World Bank organization. It's quantitative data represented on the table at the national as well as the global scale. GPS technology can be used to create a dot distribution map highlighting areas of deforestation. Or aerial photography can be a qualitative source to illustrate the extent of forest cover change. And because remote sensing can see beyond the visible portion of the electromagnetic spectrum, we can create images that are unchanged forest, represented by the light colors on this image, or where forest has been lost, represented by the red. By combining layers of data about deforestation, we can study the impact it has on plant and animal habitat loss using geographic information systems. And because media reports have drawn increased attention to deforestation, it's encouraged political leaders to make social, economic, and political changes that might be represented by policy documents. But pretty much everything I've been talking about is geographic data that you can access from a computer. So I want to end this lecture by asking a question. What can you learn about a location from field observations that you can't learn from a GIS map or online data? A famous geographer posed a similar question when he was lamenting the changes to geography programs around the country. Future geographers were spending more time behind a computer screen and less time in the field. So, in your notes, what do you think you could learn about deforestation by being in the field that you wouldn't be able to learn from a GIS map or an aerial photograph? And we'll discuss this back in class. Have a good evening, everyone.